Hi, I'm Alexa, and as you all know, I've been stuck in a Groundhog Day style time loop as cosmic punishment for releasing something as open source and not documenting it in the slightest. Today we're going to be looking at the DC offset. Why does it happen, and how can we fix it? First things first, recall that this buffer is actually working as a team with this op amp. And the reason behind that is the buffer's DC performance is awful. How awful? Well, let's take a look. Input offset voltage, 600 millivolts. <laughs> but oh, okay, sure, we can correct for a fixed offset, right? But the problem is, look at this offset drift, 700 microvolts per Celsius. So that's 0.7 millivolts, and it's going to be gained up by the total system gain, which is like 240, something like that. So yeah, that's, that's going to be real bad, right? So that's why we use the op amp. Here's the OP07. That's the initial op amp I chose for the task. Input offset voltage, 60 microvolts. Much better. Input offset voltage drift, 0.5 microvolts per degree Celsius. Okay, that's, that's much better. And then let's take a look at its replacement, the OPA140. Okay, 30 microvolts, typical. And the input offset voltage drift is slightly better. Huh. Well, m why make the change? Well, let's go back to the schematic. For op amps, there are a couple specs to be aware of. One of that, one of those specs is the input offset voltage. That's basically just rule number one of op amps being these two terminals are, are held at a potential difference of zero. Well, they're not. They're held to a difference of the offset voltage. So that's your offset voltage. And of course that will drift over time, so on and so forth. But there's another thing where there is voltage, there is also current. And that's rule number two of op amps that you've probably learned. No current goes in or out of these terminals. Well, that's also wrong. There is a current and it's called the input bias current right there, right? And that will flow in, in both of the terminals. But then on top of that, there is First, I'll just do input bias. On top of that, there's a difference in those currents called the input offset current. Why is that important for our circuit here? Well, let's ignore everything up here. Say it's an AC coupling, which is actually the worst case. We are drawing that current from this resistor. V equals IR. So when we draw that current, it becomes a voltage. In the matter of fact, it kind of gets gained up by that factor of the resistor. So let's look at input bias, input offset uh, current for the OP07. That's the buff. We don't need that anymore. OP07, input bias current. All right, 1.8 nanoamps, right? So you do some math and you say, okay, we have a 909, sorry, not 909, 90.9 K resistor. So you multiply that by 1.8 nanoamps and you get 160,000 nanoamps. So divide that by a thousand and you get 163 microvolts. And then you put that through the system gain and who oh, yeah, you're you are completely off scale. So that can be corrected for. We're still not we're still not beyond the pale here. 
So let's look at the input bias current drift. That's going to be much trickier, and we'd rather keep that low. So 18 picoamps. All right. That turns into 1.6 million picoamps, uh, sorry, picovolts. And we're going to divide that, divide that again. So that's 1.6 microvolts per degree Celsius. Considering we do have a really big system gain, that's going to become like 0.4 volts <laughs> uh, at maximum gain per degree Celsius. So that's pretty bad. The OPA140 has a much, much lower input bias current. And the reason behind that is the OP07 is a BJT input op amp, and this is a JFET input op amp. Uh, and just because of the way those uh, particular structures work, this will take very, very little current. Uh, so you can see input bias current is 0.5 picoamps and the input offset current is also 0.5 picoamps. And one more thing, just to kind of throw more shade on the uh, OP07 here, this offset and this bias, like th that, that bias goes into both terminals, right? So that's actually going to be drawn from both here and here, right? So this is going to be different from that and then on top of that, you have the input offset current, right? So you're not going to be exactly adding those two together one to one, but they are kind of a compounding effect, uh, which is, <laughs> yeah, it just gets worse uh, when it comes to input current uh, for these op amps. So we'd rather keep that very low. And in this case, it doesn't even list a uh, current drift spec because, right? It's not going to drift too, too much beyond the uh, picoamp range here. And that's kind of where we want to keep it. So those are kind of our sources of offset for the op amp, which will become the kind of dominant uh, force in the combination of these two, the composite loop uh, for DC. But there's a problem. The PGA also has an offset voltage. This one's very interesting because it's actually specified at the output. 15 millivolts. Okay, that that's not actually all that bad, right? The offset voltage drift, microvolts per degree C, at the output, so you're only really seeing the gain, the kind of digital gain in the ADC, that's really not that bad. What is pretty bad is this, the output offset voltage shift, which basically means when you're sweeping the gains around, uh, yeah, this offset's gonna change. So you're going to need to basically slightly shift things uh, for each voltage range. And then there's another thing <laughs> that affects our, our DC offset, and it's this little structure here. The reason for this is it becomes kind of a, a summing inverting amplifier type dealy, uh, where minus V bias is minus 2.5 volts. And by injecting that there, we actually bias this node, the output node, to plus 2.5 volts ish that ish is very important and the reason we do that is the pga does not have uh, dual rails it only has a single rail um, so it can't take anything below ground so we need to shift things up and then on this side here in n well, in P is our actual output. We know it's 
writing at about 2.5 volts, it has the offset. How do we trim the offset? We need to apply an equal offset to n underscore n. So let's take a look at how we do that. First, we need to generate a voltage. To do that, we use this chip right here, a digital to analog converter. You may have noticed that there are some resistors here, totaling 500 ohm in parallel, going to plus V bias. Plus V bias is plus 2.5 volts, or more accurately, it should be minus one times minus V bias. If it is not exactly that, well, you guessed it, there's more offset introduced. Why do we do that? It actually limits the swing of the output. So for this DAC, its output is zero to five volts, but we don't really need that huge swing when we only expect the signal to change by about 0.7 volts peak to peak. 0.7 volts? I thought the offset wouldn't be anywhere near that big. Well, these parts actually pull double duty in that not only are they correcting for the kind of naturally occurring uh, offset that happens in the front end circuit, but they're also uh, providing the user requested offset. Because when you move your waves up and down on your scope, you're actually adding or subtracting a voltage physically to the front end. So that's why we it matters so much to be able to cover all the different voltage ranges uh, and have enough resolution at each range. So what we used to do is we used these resistors to limit the swing of this digital to analog converter and basically gaining a little bit of extra resolution that way. But there's a problem. This is only a 12-bit DAC. And when you really think about it, we have a system converter that is eight or 12 bit, and then we have a huge system gain. If you take the log two of that gain, and we'll call it about 256 for simplicity, that's another eight. So you basically would need, if we forget the divider for a second, to brute force that voltage, you would need a 16 bit DAC in 8-bit mode, or a 20-bit DAC in 12-bit mode. <laughs> now, there's got to be a better way than that, right? That would absolutely kill the bomb cost, and there is. Instead of using a fixed divider, which can only give us a little improvement on, on these numbers, um, we use this digipod or digital potentiometer. This is really a digital rheostat. And why would we want to use that is basically so that we can have a really big swing at the low voltage ranges where we basically don't have any gain at the PGA. So we can correct the offset without worrying too much about resolution. And then we have plenty of swing left over to do whatever the user wants us to do, or at the really, really, really high gain end, at the lowest voltage range, we can crank this uh, potentiometer to like the maximum value, which is actually 50 kilo ohms for this part. Then we have a much, much more sensitive range to kind of divide by our 12 bits for the, the DAC. And in case this video wasn't sounding enough like a university lecture, let's do some math. So this is the voltage at the negative terminal of the PGA, the equation for it. Using that equation, we can figure out the maximum voltage swing, which is obtained when the digipot is set to its lowest value, which is essentially just the wiper resistance of 75 ohm. As you can see, the swing for that is uh, 
three five volts peak to peak. And that is 5.4 times greater than our 0.8 volt peak to peak uh, input signal at maximum, which is great because that means it could be a couple times higher than off scale, and then you could bring it all the way back down, which is what you expect from a scope. This is the voltage swing at the most sensitive setting, which is when that digipot is set to uh, 50k ohm. So that's uh, 49.5 millivolts. And we basically divide that by the uh, number of possibilities from the DAC and then multiply by the system gain to get 2.9 millivolts. So that is well below one LSB for 8-bit mode. And it is six LSB for 12-bit mode. So that's probably gonna be a little bit above the noise floor. Uh, we can actually improve this a little bit by moving over to the 100 kilo ohm digipot part, uh, which is available in the same package, so drop-in replacement. And that would give us three LSB, which is in the noise floor. So I'm pretty happy with that. And yeah, let's see if we can cancel that offset you saw at the very beginning of the video. Let's start by showing you the user offset. So I have a sine wave here that has a 100 millivolts DC offset. So we can basically just cancel that out using the offset field here and applying a negative 100 millivolt offset. There we go. And we can also move it up and down like this. As for that offset that you saw at the very beginning of the video, I've left channel four uncalibrated so you can see what the kind of natural state of things is uh, with the front end offset. So let's take a look at what the average value of the offset is. That is still on 10x mode. Okay, so that's 25 to 26 millivolts. We can do some math there uh, given the channel gain and find out what the calibration value should be for it. Here's the calibration file. This is channel four and its parameters. We're looking at this one right here. It's set to 2.525, which means that it assumes that the PGA's negative terminal voltage is 2.525 volts. Uh, that's clearly a little bit too high. So uh, let's use the channel gain of 1.4 uh, and basically use that to divide 26 millivolts into 18.57 millivolts. So we can basically just take this value and subtract, we'll call that 18, and that should be 2507. And give that a try. Okay, moment of truth time. That's certainly better. Yeah, it looks like we're just a uh, couple millivolts off there. But as you can see, calibration is an incredibly important part of oscilloscopes. I'm probably going to do a entire video on all the steps you need to do to fully calibrate a thunderscope. But for now, that concludes the DC offset video. I hope you enjoyed it and stay tuned for the heavy hitters of the video series, high frequency response and noise.